you're right here. Then you have the environment. Well, the environment can't change the genes that, that Trey has, can't change the genes that Sam has, but it can put them against each other in terms of competition. The idea of natural selection. Which one of these two actually has the genes that will best suit them to survive the environment? Okay, you guys all right with that? All right, so now let's sort of fast forward to the next idea. We're talking about then major causes of evolutionary change. We talk about change when our meaning is the population, not the individual. So populations, groups of individuals will change over time. So individuals best adapted for a certain environment have a better chance to survive and reproduce compared to those who are not as well as, as adapted. So I didn't mean that well. Who are not as well adapted to the environment. Neil deGrasse Tyson idea of the polar bears, right? Our idea of human skin tone, why people are of different colors, the idea of the bugs on the farm are spraying pesticides. We're all about this, right? Individuals best adapted have a better chance of surviving. Therefore, more of their kind will be found in the next generation. That's why you don't find albino, well, you do as a rough mutation, but really pale white people living in the equatorial plains, and you don't find really dark-skinned people living on the two poles. They're not adapted to survive as well as the opposite colored skin tone. Then we looked at other things that natural selection can do to a population. And we gave them kind of names. A stabilizing selection, right? Natural selection, stabilizing selection. You lose the two extremes. Human birth weights were a really good example of looking at this. Uh, why are Eskimo skin so dark? Well, they're dark, but also they have one other really cool, unique adaptation. They get a lot of vitamin D. And how do they get lots and lots of vitamin D? To throw a hiccup? Nope, not at all. Hmm. Nope. Their <laughs> now, now she's just guessing. <laughs> what are they eating? What do they have a, a major part? What part of seals? Blubber. Blubber and liver. Liver is a high source of vitamin D. And if Trey were the hunter, then he gets the first bite of either the liver or the heart to honor his kill and to honor the spirit of the animal itself. So that's how they can get around the idea of, yeah, we're darker in skin, we're the same color as Native Americans, and we live in a pretty low sunshine environment, so we should have paler skin, but because they have a high diet of, of vitamin D, which is really a hormone, not a vitamin, then that allows them to supplement themselves to be able to survive and produce that. Um, then we had directional selection, which was the idea that due to natural selection, we tend to lose one end of our average, and we get an increase in the opposite side. Then we have a diversifying selection. This one is really kind of hard to find a good example of it in biology, which is why I gave you guys an example in terms of grades. Right, where students who are C's do one of two things. They either get better and create higher grades, or they go and become worse and give lower grades. So you actually have a drop in the number of students that are average. This is what we call a bimodal graph if you had statistics. Um, the directional selection, an example could be, since we're, we're talking about, let's say, um, Eskimos. Those Eskimos that started to eat more liver and, and more fat from the seals have a better chance of surviving. So we're, we're directionally moving the population towards higher survivability for these individuals. Those folks that didn't eat as much liver don't produce as many offspring, so their genes would diminish in the population and become even perhaps extinct. All right, so we tried to talk about this a little bit yesterday and didn't get all the way through it. So the second cause of evolutionary change, besides changing in populations, is what's known as genetic drift, right? Where we're kind of, the population is drifting, and we're looking at chance events that can cause a change in the alleles. 
chance events, things like storms, um, natural disasters. And just by chance, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, and you got wiped out. Well, there are two major ways of looking at genetic drift. One is called the bottleneck effect. The other one is called the founder effect, which we haven't even addressed at all just yet. And we really haven't done modern man yet. So let's go first look at the bottleneck. The idea, the reason why it's called bottleneck is if you look at a bottle, it has a narrowing portion. So if all these individuals were trying to mass migrate out, they get stuck in the neck of the bottle. That means fewer beads can come out. That's the big key thing about then the bottleneck effect, right? Leads to a loss in population or to diversity when the population is greatly reduced. Here's the before population. Here's the after population. These little guys right here. Right? I have way fewer individuals, so chances are I would have lost some type of allele in that population. And that's what's known as a bottleneck effect. The founder effect, I don't have a slide for you guys, I don't. So if we go back to the slides, you can stick this in there. The founder effect, how can we first put it you guys can remember? All right, so if you go to a town in the Midwest and there's a family that was credited with starting the town. What label do we tend to give those people that start the town? Pioneers. They're called the founders, right? Because you're the ones that started it. So, what would you say? I said like the Denny party. Yeah. Now there's a population of people that live in the Northeast. They're rather traditional, old-fashioned, don't like modern technology. The Amish, Pennsylvania Dutch. They founded their little population. I forgot back in the 1600s it was, or early 1700s. And they didn't like outsiders. Now first think about that. We are a group of individuals from a different country. We land on this continent and we want to found and start this little township. Now, one, two, three generations go by, and you don't like outsiders. So start thinking about natural selection and ways of getting variation in a population. Right? In terms of mating, what are the two ways of getting variation in a population? You have within mating, right? Or you have outside genes coming in, which is in this. But they don't like outside genes coming in. So all they want is random mating. But think of generation after generation after generation after generation after generation. You're now maybe marrying your cousin, right? And then they have kids, and those kids are marrying those kids. But when you go to the town, you go to the community, if you're a geneticist, or even just a scientist, period, first of all, I always have two things in the back of my mind. What do I expect to find, and what I actually do find? Expectation and observation are always in the back of your mind as a scientist. What do I expect to find based upon previous knowledge and understanding? And then be wide open minded and what, what did I really find? And what they found was very few genetic mutations. They expected a lot due to the math, but they didn't find as many as they should have had. So they were doing a really good job at varying the random mating within a group. And we'll talk about that maybe a bit later. But now they're becoming a little more modern. They're actually allowing us that they're, they're 18 year olds to actually lead the community, go to the outside world, and make a choice. You want to stay out there or be a member of our community still? So now they're getting kind of a fresher supply of, of gene flow. But that's what the founder effect is is that based upon the size of the original population, the smaller the population, the greater the chance of having little variation. The bigger the population, the greater the chance of variation and surviving. That's why it's important to have a large group. If you want to start a population as a wildlife biologist, whether it's animals or plants, you can't just put one male and one female and say, go to it and survive. Because your first generation, who are they going to mate with? Oh, that's going to be already inbreeding right off the bat. But if I bring in, instead of one couple, 50 couples, 
there's a better chance of random mating, population gets big, somebody migrates out, somebody migrates in, and we have a good set of, of genes. Modern man, this is the cause of evolutionary change. This is a rather new idea, relatively speaking. Um, started probably when I was in high school. And the bottom line is we're screwing things up pretty badly. Um, for example, elephants, the ivory trade. It's one of the biggest examples to look at. Roughly around what, 30 to 40,000 elephants are killed each year for the ivory. All they do is kill the animal, take a power saw, chop the ivory off, and the carcass rots in the African plains. It is guessed that if we continue this pace, that by the time my godkids, so one of my godchildren is now teaching high school, my goddaughter is entering her senior year at U of O. I can't fault her or blame her for that part. All right. She's going to go to graduate school, all right? but within the next five years, they're maybe both starting a family. By the time their kids are in high school, you may not have an African elephant. They are that close to mass extinction because of us. Because we want their ivory. And we're killing them off right and left. Um, orangutans, they may be gone in the next 25 years. Because we're chopping down their forests to make palm tree farms. So they can make palm oil, which is a good industrial lubricant. It's a food additive. We're having a huge effect on animal populations. And there's a real simple fix for this. It's not going to happen overnight. Well, it could if we created laws and then we actually enforced the laws. I mean, it's illegal for ivory trade. It still happens because no one has the money to supply the soldiers to prevent the poachers from killing the elephants. But the bottom line is we have way too many people for our natural resources. If you want to have your cake and eat it too, we need to start teaching about population control. Um, Charles Darwin had 10 children. In his day, that was okay, because three of them died of, of diseases as a young child. Abraham Lincoln lost one child due to disease. But that's why you were programmed to have lots of children, because natural selection says you're gonna lose some to hunting accidents, some are gonna be preyed upon, some will die of disease. So if you have lots to begin with, by the time you're surviving, maybe you only have five actually living. But people like large families today. But we have medicine, we have food. The chance of dying as a young child are pretty far gone today compared to a long time ago. So you can't have three, four, five, six children. Because that means the population is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Even if you have two people, have one couple has two children, we're maintaining the same population size of 7.5 billion people. And the planet cannot handle it at the moment. Because apparently we have 7.5 billion people that want ivory, well not everybody does, but the idea is there. Then I need to kill more elephants. What if you only had 3 billion people? There's still a desire for ivory, but now we have enough of a balance between those that want it and elephants dying of old age and taking their tusks once they've died of old age and selling them for those folks that want them. It's just a little food for thought, but that'll take several generations to go through and to do. It's also really one of the reasons why I don't have kids. I don't want to add to the problem. I want to add to the solution and the slowing down of population growth. Anyways, enough of that. Okay, a little food for thought though. All right, gene flow. We just can't have it anymore. A population may gain or lose alleles when gametes move. So we've already talked about some of these. Fertilized seeds and spores move. Well, they move because of the wind. We really haven't addressed it that much, but this is why when you look at um, mushrooms have spores and, and plants like bryophytes, mosses and ferns have spores. They want the wind to pick up the spores and to disperse them throughout the place, the, the territory. They can travel miles sometimes. Fertile individuals move into the group. We've done that one. What's the other name for that? We just talked about it within the last five minutes. Newcomers, right? People move in to a new population. Fertile individuals move out of a group. Well, that also caused a change in the genes, moving in and moving out, arriving or going someplace else. The bottom two, really, in terms of animals, 
is how Mother Nature always operates. Most animals only mate with one mate each year, a different mate each year. That's random mating. And they spend a lot of energy migrating to the place that they actually do mate. So nature's doing a pretty good job of trying to do this. It's us that are screwing things up. All right, some physical differences. What's known as sexual dimorphism. There is a general rule in biology. Don't forget though, when I talk about a, a general rule, that means there's always gonna be an exception found somewhere. The general rule is males tend to be larger than females. Many times males are also the more colorful of the animals. Think about birds. Think about ducks, the mallard duck. Can you guys picture a mallard duck in your mind? If you can't picture a mallard duck, how about a peacock? All right? You want the really big, beautiful feathers? That's the male. The female's rather dull and boring. Sorry, gals. All right? But that's the general rule in biology. The reason males are way more colorful is that females need a way to figure out which male she wants to mate with, which male's genes she wants access to. Because good, big, bright, beautiful feathers means you're healthy, you can survive. Dull feathers means there's something wrong with you. Either you're sick, or you're not good at finding food, whatever it is, I don't want it in my gene flow. But look at the irony of it. If the general rule in the animal world is males are the bigger and the more beautiful, the more colorful, the more elaborate, think about the mane of a, of a lion, right? Females don't have that mane. But that name for the lion does two things. It protects him in male-male combat, but it also is his swagger. It lets females know just how sexy and how powerful he is. Because the bigger it is, the darker it is, the more testosterone he has, the better genes he has, and the females want those genes in her cubs. So she'll pick the dude with the bigger mane. But there's one really interesting animal that totally flips that around. How many guys in here wear lipstick? <laughs> Eyeshadow. How come we have turned it completely around? It's an interesting idea to think about. So, when it comes time to now having sexual selection, so remember we have natural selection, now we're going to have sexual selection. Selection by the sexes. There's two different kinds of sexual selection. There's male versus male, right? And what's really kind of fun to do, if you guys ever have the chance, or if you don't have the chance, make yourselves have the chance, go to a really popular bar and sit in the back corner and just drink soda and be there for many hours, especially from the hours of 10 to closing, and watch the interaction between guys. And the guys get stupid after having too much to drink, right? You get a bit of a conflict. What do guys do when they want to sort of show the bravado? They stand upright more, and it's more of looking right, and they kind of puff themselves up. Kind of look a little more intimidating. Why are they doing that? Because guess who's watching the guys get stupid? The females. The females, right? Who's going to win the fight? But also females look at guys' cars, right, and their shoes and their clothing. It speaks to their financial status. When males fight against other males, four females, that is known as intra-sexual selection. Because Ken's intra refers to what? Within. Within, within, within what? They're within the individual? Sex. Or in this case, within the same sex, right? It's fighting between the same sexes for the potential mate. Now, it's usually males against males, because females are the ones that do the picking. But you also get females fighting females for males. And that's also still intra-sexual, yes, Elizabeth. Oh, there's a, um, damn, man, it's not my fault. I didn't even say nothing. This is not right. There. 
But there's a video on, she was saying there's a video on Facebook of the penguins fighting each other and they go back and forth and there's like um, a little animated like person in the background like, you're not going to take my woman and they go back and right. forth and then the woman ends up choosing the penguins, other male. penguins are monogamous, but like the penguin came back and his wife was taken. Yeah, so like no, she, he let him choose. Like a fight. He <laughs> let him choose though. He, he yeah. let her choose and she I'm, went with the other guy. And then they fought again. Yeah. Send me the link. I think it's... <laughs> totally misinterpreted. I, I haven't seen it. I'm guessing, however, what they actually did is they took a clip of um, females fighting other females because one of the females lost her egg, her chick, and she's actually trying to steal another chick from another female. Oh. So send me the link. That's what I'm thinking it I actually will. is. Um, we'll have to see because... I know, right? I was like, Damn. Yeah, we'll have to see bring how that the, works. Bring the, you know, now, viral <laughs> video to the biologist. Once the males are done with their intrasexual selection, now, all right, I won the bar fight. Now somebody has to pick me. A female has to pick me. So that's between different sexes. That is intersexual selection. So when a female picks the male, that's inter? Of selection. All right, so intra is competition within the same sex for mates. Inter is now where one sex picks the other sex as a potential mate. So that would be the females being choosy? Females being choosy, exactly. This is hilarious. Now the question is, why has natural selection put this process into place? Why do we have sexual selection? Why are females choosy? Remember, Kenzie? Darwinian fitness. The pastor genes on. Well, true. So I want you to think about mate selection as a business, so not as a romance. All right, think of it as a business. Because females because have to they like have the babies. sit on the baby or, you know, carry the baby for months and exactly. months and months. But the, men, right. the men can just, like, go anywhere. Exactly. Right? And it, it will kind of make sense now in your own lives. Think of it in this True. context. True. Let's do humans for the moment. Who actually has to carry the developing embryo and fetus, male or females? Female. All right. When females are carrying their developing embryo and fetus, where does the nutrients come from to feed the developing embryo and fetus? Female. From the mom's body fat, right? And so in a way, this is why women get these cravings. Because it's their brain saying you're lacking a little bit maybe in some certain nutrients that you're going to want to give to your developing offspring. Who has the risk of dying during the childbirthing process? The female, right? All right. Who then has to nurse the young for the first few months, the male or the female? Female. Where does the calories come from to produce the milk to feed the developing child? Body fat. This is why, on average, females have more body fat than males do. Because your body fat is your bank account reserve of energy to survive during times of famine because you're carrying the developing young or the next generation. Now, in the animal world, th that holds true too, right? Lions, who gives birth? The lioness. Um, who nurses the developing cubs, the lioness, whether you're a lion, a cheetah, a, a primate, a gorilla, a chimpanzee, the females carry the young, they give birth to the young, they nurse the young. Now who protects the young from predators? On average, it's the female. Let's say the mama. Who has to teach the young what to kill, what not to kill, and how to kill what you're wanting to kill? The it's the female. <laughs> Where in the hell's the dude during all this? Not necessarily <laughs> sleeping. His seed. He might be sleeping. He's spreading he's also his seed elsewhere. Copulating with as many females as possible. Yeah, I was gonna say he's somewhere else right? doing his thing. So now think of this. This is really I'm like him. Imagine, but it's the day before Thanksgiving, anyways. <clears throat> the scenario of let's say I'm walking down the sidewalk with my um, imaginary mate, and let's put down in your own mind whatever that would be a 20-year-old <clears throat> attractive individual for me. And you had the old stereotype of, you know, we're walking hand in hand, and this young gal walks by, and I, I, I watch her, and I walk into a phone booth or a telephone pole, <laughs> right? And then what is my mate going to do? She's going to smack. What are you looking at? 
All right. Now, if you're looking at me being 56 years old and my mate being 56 years old, what can my mate no longer do, actually? Produce young. Why did my head turn to follow the much younger female? Because I've been programmed biologically to look for potential mates all the time, to find the most fittest female. Because what is my job as a male? Perfect. To produce as many young as possible. What is your job as a female? To produce as many young as possible. But biologically, I can go on for a much greater period of time. And I also have a much less cost. All I got to do is provide sperm. What do you have to do? You have to be pregnant. The risk of dying during birth, nursing the young, teaching the young, defending the young from predators. No wonder you're choosy. If you're making a business deal, right, you want the best possible business partner. You're not going to take any old schmuck that walks around, right? You want to have good genes. And today, it isn't just good genes. It's, what do you do for a living? How much money do you make? How many houses do you have? How Why? <laughs> Why? Because raising the kids about what, 1.5 million dollars these days? That's crazy. I mean, this is why I'm the godfather to my two god kids, right? My job as a godfather is to do what? To help the parents raise their children. Mm -hmm. I've got two kids I'm trying to help support. That's why I don't have any kids for one reason. Another reason because of the population issues. But it costs a lot of money to raise children, provide health care, food, education. That's another reason why you're looking at, well, yeah, he's really cute and he's sexy, he's good in bed, but he doesn't have a really good job. Hell yeah. <laughs> right? oh my goodness, no. And so now you want to look for the potential mate that will provide the best for you. But you're ingrained into this. We're not in high school no more. And that's why we talk about nature has to set it up so that females will make the best possible business choice. That's why it's not about love and romance. It's about business. Yes, it from is. From a biological perspective. Hallelujah. Right? And this is why males get cocky and stupid. They're programmed because they need to be picked by the females. And this is why females are picky, because they're programmed because they have the greater risk compared to males. And you'll find that example all throughout the animal world, including humans. We do the exact same thing. Think about the scenario of you talking to your, a, a, a female friend of yours going, why are you dating that dude? He sucks. He's a bum. He doesn't have a job. He's never had a job. And he, he's been arrested three times. <laughs> yeah, but he's really fun in bed. So the sex is great. Okay, that's one reason, right? Or how about a polygamous relationship? We have multiple male partners. Like, why, why don't you just pick one guy and stick with the one dude? Well, this guy's filthy rich. We went to Paris last weekend for lunch. This guy is a great outdoorsman. He likes to go backpacking and fishing and, and hiking. And this guy over here is really smart. Different needs are being met that the one person might have. So think about it now for the rest of your lives is why are you picking the person you're picking? And why do people want to have multiple partners versus one partner? There are reasons for both biologically. They both make sense. To that, Let's look at this. This is a good example of sexual dimorphism. This is a male peacock. It costs him a lot of money, biologically, to have these really cool feathers. But there's also a huge cost to being a really big, sexy male. He's easy to see. If I'm a predator, I can find him pretty easy. But the fact that he's still around means he's got some skills. He's able to survive. How come the lionesses do all the hunting, by the way? Because we're smarter. The female is hunting because they have the heart to be seen by the predator because it's Yeah, they're more dull. So they they can blend in. So they can blend in. It's easier for them to sneak up on the prey. I'm a really big, huge, sexy male. I weigh 500 pounds. I have a huge, big, black, dark mane. How am I going to sneak up on a gazelle? You're going to see me a mile away. But the females are like little ninjas. They're small, harder to see. The only time you see a male actually bring down big prey is for water buffalo, where you need a big, you need the battleship to come in and, and give the final blow. Otherwise, the females do the killing, and here's the really unfortunate thing. 
All right? Females risk their lives, risk their bodies to make a kill, and guess who gets to eat first? The male. The guy after he wakes up from a nap. <laughs> gets to eat as much as he wants to, which can be 80 pounds in one sitting, which is the average weight of a gazelle almost in terms of the good edible parts. Doesn't seem fair, right? But don't forget, the male's job is to do what? Provide sperm. That's his job. And to protect the entire group from other predators, other males. He's your army and he's your sperm bank, which is why nature gives him first picks over food. They can't have a starving battleship. They can't have a starving army. Shouldn't it be the babies first? Uh-uh. No. Because they can't eat meat anyways. Oh. Now, what's interesting, though, is that the male will actually allow the cubs to eat off the carcass while he's eating, but he won't let females do it. Because he has understanding in his mind that these are my young and they need to survive, so I'll tolerate them. But Just I don't get too close to me as I'm eating. Mm -hmm. Oh. All right, so all this comes down to the idea of Darwinian fitness. When you hear about Darwinian fitness, it is not about how far Muhammad could run, how much weight you can lift. Darwinian fitness in a biological context means your ability to produce young. How many can you make and raise to adulthood? The more you can raise, the more Darwinian fit you are. So compared to my best friend, who I'm the godfather to his two children, he has two children that are not capable of having babies of their own. So he is more Darwinian fit than I am. I have zero children. Now, the next door neighbor has four children. That next door neighbor is more Darwinian fit than my best friend. And my best friend is more Darwinian fit than me. It's the number of young you produce, and you can keep healthy and alive for them to raise to adulthood. You've now done your job as a parent because they can produce their own young. Does adulthood determine when they produce their own young, or is it like when you're capable? Okay. When you're capable of having your own young. Well, that leads us then to the idea of, of what species are. There are several different ways of defining a species. We'll kind of go through these over a couple of days. But there's the biological part, um, in other words, your physiology and such. Your morphology, which means what you look like, but it's your shape in a sense. Your genealogical, that should make sense, that's your genes. All right, then you've got ecological, which is where you live. We're going to kind of look at these different ways of defining the species. It sometimes leads to arguments. For example, is a Great Dane a dog? Mm -hmm. A Great Dane's a dog, right? Mm -hmm. How about that thing, I think it's called a chihuahua, <laughs> <laughs> which are snacks for Great Danes, and are they, are they a dog? Yeah. Yeah. So they're the same species, right? Yeah, they are. Can a Great Dane mate with a chihuahua? No. no. Yeah. Yeah. Really? No. If you, if the, yeah. the chihuahua no has to be the male. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Okay. See, now it kind of depends, right? Oh, what if a male great dane mm -hmm. and a female chihuahua? Yeah, it's not a pretty picture in your mind, <laughs> is it? All right. So are they the same species? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe they are. Maybe they're not. Hmm. So. How do you keep species from disappearing? How do you maintain the breed in a sense? What I call kind of keeping it in the family. How do you keep closely related species from mixing it up? <coughs> Physical barriers for one, right? Like an ocean, a mountain, a river. You guys ever heard of bonobos? Mm -hmm. Right? Cousins to chimpanzees. How come bonobos don't make chimpanzees? How come they're two separate species? Because they are separated by the Congo River. And chimps can't swim. But they, they could actually probably yell at each other across the riverbank. That's how close they are. But they're still separate groups. If you live in South America, can you mate with somebody in Africa? Probably not, right? Separation of geological barriers helps mm -hmm. to keep different groups different. Think about all those different birds that Darwin found on the different islands, right? Separated by geological barriers. And that's a physical barrier. Then you have non-physical barriers. Oh, I guess you better define what Al Patrick is. That's just 
speciation, becoming a species because of a physical barrier. Becoming a species because of separation by a physical barrier. Then we have non-physical barriers. Right? Can you say that one more time? It's becoming a species due to a physical barrier. Like a river, a mountain, an ocean. Can you give an example of one? Uh, the, the, the chimps and the bonobos, the different um, tortoises on the various islands. If you live in South America, you can't, probably can't mate with somebody in um, Africa. Then you have non-physical barriers, which means you live in the same place. So we call that sympatric. It's speciation due to non-physical barriers. But now when you look at the non-physical barriers, we have two subcategories of this. It's called pre-zygotic barriers and post-zygotic barriers. What is a zygote? Spermatizing. Spermatizing. Spermate come together. So think about the name, right? Prezygotic, meaning before the egg and sperm come together, there's some kind of a barrier, some kind of a boundary that can't be crossed. Postzygotic would be, well, after fertilization, there's some kind of a barrier that prevents speciation from happening. We're going to walk through some examples of these. This would be a geological allopatric, right, where you've got this mountain range that separates them, right? So these guys aren't going to cross the mountain to go mate, so they're stuck where they live. So that's an allopatric speciation, separated by a physical barrier of some kind. Some other, now, non-physical. This is a sympatric example. You can have temporal isolation, where two different kinds of animals live in the same place, but they mate during different times of the year. Right? You can have habitat isolation, where they live in the same continent, but different parts of the same continent. You can have behavioral, where the behaviors don't match. We're going to look at an example of that in a moment. Then you can have mechanical isolation. Let's go back to the male Great Dane and the female Chihuahua. It ain't going to fit. All right? That's a mechanical isolation. That prevents males from mating with females. That helps to keep the species separate. All right? Gamete isolation. The idea of, of meiosis, where chromosomes line up, right? Non disjunction ideas. Different numbers of chromosomes. That can also help, help them maintain species. This is an example of behavioral isolation. This is a choosy female, and it's, what kind of a bird is this? Yeah, so you guys learned about a bird already. And there's the male doing his thing. He has to do it perfectly. If he screws up in the slightest way, she loses interest. So if he doesn't know how to do the dance, then she's not going to pick him as a mate. That is behavioral isolation. Some post-psychotic ideas we're going to look at. Sometimes they do mate, and they produce embryos, and the embryos grow to become a fetus, and the fetus gets born, and you have now young. We call those then a hybrid, where you get two different species mating to produce a different combination of genes. Like mules? Like who? Mules. Like mules, right? But however now, when that happens, usually, generally, the hybrids are not fertile. They're incapable of producing young which means they're incapable of passing the genes on to the next generation. It's a dead end. Yeah, they made and produced young, but remember, those young can't produce their own. So they're not Darwinian fit. It was a you know, nice time at night, you, have, you got pregnant, but then those the offspring will die, or they themselves can't produce their own young, so you're not continuing the speciation. Well, let's look at a mule. Mm. All right, little interesting animal um, vocabulary for you guys. So, <clears throat> the white dude on our left hand corner is a male horse. What's a male horse called? Called a stallion, right? 
So you have male horse is a stallion. Oops. Now, a male horse with a female donkey. Oops, I can spell female. Come on. What is a female donkey known as? A donkey. No, a Jenny. Oh. They're called Jennies. Now, this is the funny part. When a stallion mates with a Jenny, what do you get? A stallion. Okay, no, no, this is not me making it up, right? So when a stallion mates with a Jenny, what do you get? You get a, a stallion. Little hiney. You get a little hiney. That's what it's called. Okay. A uh, different word. So you get a hiney. All right. What, however, if you have a female horse, what is she called? She's called a mare. Now, you got a male donkey. What's a male donkey called? A jack. Called a jack. No. So if a mare mates with a jack, what do you get? You get a mule. So high knees are because of a stallion mating with a jenny. But a mare mating with a jack gives you a mule. Why is it in any way different? <laughs> because it comes down to who's capable of producing young and who's not. A mule is sterile. But cannot I mean, produce young. The only reason we have mules is because we have bred them together. Now, think about evolution. It's, a, it's a, an idea of where there are advantages and disadvantages as you evolve. You gain some ability, but you lose some other ability. What's the evolutionary advantage to having a mule? They are a lot stronger and calmer than horses. They make really good backpack animals for carrying cargo and crate in the 1800s, 1700s, 1600s. And we figured this out. They're more sure-footed, they're calmer. Not as jerky as dumb? Um, some can be smarter, some can be dumber. But the one big disadvantage is they're sterile. You can't get mules to mate. So if you want another mule, you gotta do your own little artificial selection, in a sense, to create these guys. So does a mule meet the definition of Darwinian fitness? No, not at all, right? It's a dead end. How about these cool guys? A liger, a zonkey, tigon, a wolfen. What the hell are these things? They're all hybrids. Now, that is a liger. They are huge. They're much bigger than a lion or a tiger. Now the naming scheme is pretty cool. Liger is a lion with a tiger. The first part of the name is due to the male. So it's a male lion with a female tiger. You got a zonkey, a male zebra with a female donkey, right? Tigon, a male tiger with a female lion. So are they? Some are. Well, so male ligers, yes. Female ligers are capable of having young. But now, let's go back to the idea of keeping it in the family, the idea of speciation. These guys are a behavioral prezygotic barrier. They live right next door to each other, right? But tigers live in the jungle and lions live out in the African plains. They never do mate by themselves. The only reason we have these poor creatures is because we have bred them together. And they don't live very long. They have a lot of neurological problems. This is really kind of a cruel thing to do. So just because we can do it doesn't mean that we should do it. Is it legal to do it? Um, I don't think there's any actual laws against it right now. It's more of a moral issue. And again, same thing with the zonkeys, right? Zebras and donkeys don't live together. So nature's already set it up for this not to happen. These are the ideas of pre-zygotic barriers, perhaps. Yeah, they live in the same geographical area, but because of their behavior, the time of year they mate, um, what kind of pheromone, hormone signals they produce, 
a zebra would never really be interested in mating with a donkey, and a lion would never be interested in mating with a tiger. Well, you get your hands so high up there, it's like I'm dying to ask a question. Okay. What is a tiger on here? Right. Tiger, Look how big tiger, they are. They are huge. And the lion, the tiger is the right? dad. And the yeah, lion. this guy could lion bite her head off without a single problem. Wow. You mentioned a wolf. What's a wolf? Yeah, what's a... A wolf mixed with... Um, it's a dolphin with um, an orca, I believe. Uh -huh. Now, there, there is a natural one. There is a natural hybrid out there that was gaining our interest as a zoologist. It's called a... Um, What's it called now? Uh, it's a coyote with a wolf. Um, a coyote. Not, not coyote. Um, oh, shoot. What's it called now? All of a sudden. We're finding wolves are mating with coyotes, creating a hybrid, but it's a naturally occurring hybrid. More common up in Pennsylvania, New York, um, 